You're listening to Tech Forward. I'm your host, Cheryl Chotrani. I'm a tech founder, developer, investor, and an industry enthusiast. And I believe that diversity can transform businesses and improve the world we live in. The Tech Forward podcast is a place for tech entrepreneurs, executives, venture capitalists, and diversity champions to share their stories, insights, and visions of the future. Together, we'll discuss the path to improving representation for women, minorities, and other underrepresented groups. What challenges, strategies, and possible solutions will shape the road ahead? Let's find out together. Hello, listeners. I'm delighted to welcome our guest today to Tech Forward. I'll be speaking with Jennifer Marsman, the principal software engineer of Microsoft's AI for Earth Group, where she uses data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence to aid with clean water, agriculture, biodiversity, and climate change. Since 2016, Jennifer has been recognized as one of the top 100 most influential individuals in artificial intelligence and machine learning by Analytica, reaching the number two slot in 2018. She's won numerous other awards. She holds two patents for her work in search and data mining algorithms, and she previously held positions with Ford Motor Company, National Instruments, and SOAR Technology. Today, we'll be talking about some of the amazing work she's been leading for their AI for Earth group and some of the things that Microsoft is doing to create a more welcoming environment for female engineers. I'm sure you'll be as fascinated by the conversation as I was. So let's get right to it. Hi, Jennifer. Welcome to the show. Thank you for speaking with me today. Thank you for having me. So how did you get into computer science initially? Like during your childhood, did you always know that this is something that you wanted to go into? What initially sparked your interest? Like how did you get in the field? I didn't. I did not always know. I did have a very supportive family. I always loved science. So I took astrophysics class in in college and did kind of some other stuff. But I think what kind of led me to the path was computer games. And I'm sure this is a very similar thing for a lot of other folks my age. But King's Quest was unique. Like King's Quest 1 was about you know, the knight who eventually became king by the end when he solved the challenge. And then he gets the princess, marries her, they become king and queen. They have perfect little twin babies and whatever. And so it's very, that's like King's Quest 1, 2, and 3. And then by King's Quest 4, the character that you moved around in the little world was a female for the first time. The original king is very sick and his daughter, Rosella, has to go like find him medicine essentially to save him. And so it was another one of these little things where you're you're walking around in a little world and you're interacting with little AI characters, basically trying to fulfill some quest. And I loved it. But a game like that, where you were interacting with other people in a world and you had some quest and you were trying to solve it, like that was just so yeah. much fun. And so I got really into these computer games. And then Mm -hmm. the idea that I could build this for a living, like I could create this, being able to understand the language of the program and be able to speak to a computer and tell the computer what to do was really exciting to me and design something like that. Well, it's amazing that you figured that out at a young age. Yeah, yeah. It was about high school. That was kind of where it got started. And then I did my first internship after, I think after my freshman year of college, I did an internship at a Ford Motor Company and I loved it. It was, I was like, I can do this every day for the rest of my life. Like I I really enjoy coding. I saw how to do it as a team, that it was a team sport. It's not something where, you know, doing it all by yourself, kind of a whole group of people all build software together. Um, and all those diverse perspectives kind of go into the software, you end up building something, you know, much, much better. So I know you've recently taken on a new role as the principal engineer for the AI for Earth team at Microsoft. So talk a little bit about that and what that team does and then why you decided to make the switch. Yeah. So I heard about that team. So I was working in a team called the Commercial Software Engineering Group at Microsoft, and I was very happy there. That, that was a great team that I was on. And I heard about the AI for Earth team. They they had reached out to me. And basically what that team is doing is Microsoft has publicly committed $50 million over the next five years towards projects that use machine learning and artificial intelligence in the areas of agriculture, clean water, climate change, and biodiversity. And that was just so exciting to me because 
that was a chance to use, you know, my passion for machine learning to like really make a difference. So I think that's what really inspired me. Um, with all the travel, I, I do have to travel still in my role. I've, I've been um, in a traveling role, you know, in the last 10 years or so. And when I am away, I have three young kids. And so if I'm away from them, I want to make sure that I'm doing something that's really worth it. You know, I'm doing something that's important and meaningful and, and work that's going to make a difference. And so the AI for Earth team just seemed like a amazing opportunity to channel my passion for machine learning towards all of these projects. There's a whole lot of cool stuff and a whole lot of interesting engineering work we're doing there. So first of all, there's the grant program. Currently, we have over 110 grantees um, in over 27 countries that are doing projects and receiving grants. So I support them and help them be successful. I just try to help wherever I'm needed there to help them be successful. And then the second part is that we are actually building a set of APIs ourselves. So we released a private preview at Build, our big, last big Microsoft conference, was a land cover mapping API. And basically, you send us input some satellite imagery of an area. And then what we give you back is a pixel level classification of, you know, this is water, this is tree, this is, you know, a building or road. So that way people can use it for things like urban development and tracking deforestation and all kinds of useful things like that. That's fascinating. <laughs> I know. It's so cool. Yeah. And then the third bit um, is that we also work very closely. We fund um, various projects in Microsoft Research and work very closely with them. And so there's two projects there that I am super excited about. One of them is a project called Farm Beats. I was reading about that and it's, I think it's super interesting. Oh my goodness, it's so cool. The Farm Beats project is, the idea behind it is basically to try to reduce world hunger, which is a, you know, an amazing goal. And at a meeting of the United Nations in uh, 2009, they actually uh, released the fact that we need to double our current rate of food production by the year 2050 um, if we're going to be able to feed the world's growing population. And so what that group of researchers at Microsoft Research did was try to figure out, okay, how do we do that? What different things can we do? And what's cool about this is that it's not just like one product. It's like they had to bring together IoT and drones and machine learning and cutting edge networking research like to make this happen. So essentially there's, you know, you can use a technique called precision agriculture where instead of, let's take the case of precision irrigation, for example. So instead of homogeneously watering a field so that every part of the field gets the same amount of water, you can actually just use the water that you need and you're actually saving a lot of money and water and natural resources and stuff as well. What you can do is use sensors in the ground. And the first challenge we ran into is the fact that it costs about $1,000 per sensor. And that was just crazy to me because I don't know if you've done any IoT work, but you'll know that sensors are usually like in the tens <laughs> of dollars, not in the thousands of dollars. So that's off by two orders of magnitude. And what I found out was that it isn't actually the cost of the sensor. The cost of the sensor is in the, the tens of dollars. My second guess was, okay, maybe it's the cost of the, you know, the power because you don't have electrical outlets in the middle of the field. But it wasn't that either. Uh, it turns out, you know, we use solar panels and those cost maybe 50 to to $100 US. And it turns out that the real cost, where the bulk of that $1,000 a sensor was coming from, was connectivity. So getting data off of those sensors into the cloud where we can do something useful with it. And so there's two different ways that we really tackled that. The first way was to use fewer sensors and then augment that with aerial imagery. So we can have drones flying overhead, or you can actually, in some areas where the regulations and such are such that it's not very effective to use drones, you can use um, like large helium balloons and kind of tether them to the ground and have a, have a camera on the large helium balloon and tether that and then you have that to get the aerial imagery. But then we can take that aerial imagery and put it together with the data from the sensors that we do have, and then be able to draw kind of a map of the moisture levels of the entire field. Because if there's um, an area that was recently watered, it's going to be darker. And so you can kind of see, oh, if it's darker right here where there's a sensor and it's darker over here where we don't have a sensor, you can kind of extrapolate from that data and figure out the overall moisture levels. And that's just precision irrigation. Um, this can be applied to a whole lot of things. Um, one of the ones I'm especially passionate about is precision pesticides. And that is really, uh, really a great use case because when you think about it, you don't want to be spraying pesticides everywhere if it's not needed, right? Not at all. <laughs> exactly. It's, right. it's more expensive for the farmer 
um, because pesticides are actually very, very expensive and it's worse for the environment and it's it's bad for all of us who are eating that food. So if we can figure out here's where the pests actually are and then be able to just have it where it's actually needed, then we're we're optimizing and, and kind of helping everyone, saving money and, and saving the environment and making it more more healthy for the people eating the food. So a lot of okay. really cool stuff on on farm beets. This particular project mainly addresses increasing the yield of the thing. It doesn't handle the the additional challenge of distribution right. of the food. And there are probably other groups at Microsoft working on that right now, how to get the food to the right places at the right times, because um, that's another kind of logistical problem. This one is focused on kind of data-driven mm-hmm. farming and increasing the yield and helping the farmer be you know as efficient as possible. Which is super important. Yeah, in a sustainable way too, because you can't yeah. destroy the soil because there's ways of like having a great two seasons or so, but then you kind of wear out the soil and then doesn't it's not a sustainable approach. So we, we want it to be a good long-term solution as well. Yeah. But there's been projects set up all over that are implementing this today. And then you were going to mention another program? Yeah, there's another project called Project Premonition. This is another exciting piece of research that's done by Microsoft Research. And the idea behind that one is to actually be able to predict the outbreak of disease before it happens. Um, so currently, when there's an outbreak of disease, what the way, the way it usually goes down is that a bunch of people get sick, and then they all go to their doctors, and then doctors report the instances of disease that they're seeing to some central organization like the Center for Disease Control or the World Health Organization or something like that. And then they aggregate that data and then realize, oh, my goodness, we have an outbreak, you know, in this area of this particular disease. But that usually doesn't happen until, you know, two weeks to a month after the outbreak has already happened. Um, and so at that point, it's you're containing it, but it's, it's already spread to the point that it's become an outbreak. The idea behind Project Premonition is to try to kind of get ahead of that by instead using little data gatherers that are mosquitoes. So mosquitoes, when you think about it, they land on animals and they land on humans and they extract blood, right, for their for their meals. And so they are collecting blood samples of a, you know, a great distribution all over the place. And so if we can actually uh, get that blood with our genomics pipeline, we can actually reverse engineer it that from a from a mosquito's blood sample, we can tell what kind of animal it came from, whether it's a human or a pig or a cow or what kind of animal, and then what diseases they're carrying. So you can actually get a general sense of the health of the population just from the mosquitoes. So we're using a lot of machine learning in that genomics pipeline to be able to do that. And then we also have an automated trap. So there's this a trap. It looks like a cylinder and there's a circle in the center. So you can insert a lure in the center to, to lure insects to the trap. And we can use like CO2 is pretty effective with uh, mosquitoes or else you can use various scents or light and that attracts insects in. And then there's 64 individual little doors. And then Basically, a fly or a bee or various other kinds of insects could fly in and then fly away. And then we've actually built a little machine learning classifier right into that device so that if a mosquito flies into one of those little little rooms, a trap door will actually close boop, and, and trap the mosquito inside. So it will only catch mosquitoes um, with over 90% accuracy rather than other insects. And it's using um, essentially kind of the wing beat patterns of the insect is one of the main things that are used. There's a little thing of light that kind of the light patterns that are thrown based on the wing beat speeds that are what enable us to do that. So it's extremely cool. So there's machine learning there. And you can also use machine learning to figure out where to put the traps, where we can best get um, mosquitoes. So we use machine learning for figuring out where to place the traps. We use machine learning inside of the traps to only catch mosquitoes. And then we use machine learning in the genomics pipeline to be able to figure out what kind of animal the blood came from and what diseases they have and such. Amazing. Well, I mean, it's it's funny to think of mosquitoes as being a life-saving agent because typically we think of mosquitoes as actually carrying disease and passing along disease to humans. So it's fascinating that you're able to use them for positive purpose. 
Yes, I thought the same thing, Cheryl. It's so funny because, you know, bees, you know, bees sting you, but they at least they do pollination. Mosquitoes are one of those things that it's like, what benefit to society do you have at all? You are just annoying. But no, it is so cool that such a good use for mosquitoes has been found. Absolutely. So much of your career has focused on machine learning and artificial intelligence. And of course, you know, as you've just highlighted and, and all of the projects that you've mentioned, those technologies have an amazing capacity to do great things and provide significant benefits to society. But there's a lot of concern and definitely people that are worried about those technologies also introducing or furthering bias and providing more inequality, depending upon like what the inputs are right into the technology. So what is your perspective on that? And then how do you and your work or how do you advise companies address that and ensure that as these technologies are being developed, that they actually allow for equitable provision of resources and eliminate or at least kind of limit the furthering of bias through them? Yes, that's an excellent question. 10 points to Gryffindor. (laughs) So bias is a huge thing that you have to be cognizant of uh, if you're doing machine learning. All of supervised machine learning is essentially using a labeled data set. You're using data, you're using historical data to make future predictions. And so, yes, if there is any kind of bias in that historical data or things that have been always done a certain way, then yes, that is going to be uh, captured in your in your machine learning algorithm. And what can be scary there is that, you know, a lot of people don't understand machine learning. And so they may assume that, oh, the machine learning algorithm said this, it must be right, because it's just magic to them. And that's not right. So you do. Mm-hmm. So the, kind of the first step is to just be extremely cognizant of it and then make sure that people who are using your algorithms understand the data that it was trained with and how that data was collected. And I think anyone who is practicing machine learning today has that responsibility of of knowing, you know, understanding where the data you're using came from and being aware of the bias that's inherent to it. That is a kind of a huge issue because uh, your, your model is only as good as the data you train it with. So garbage in, garbage out. Right. And so there's been a lot of examples of that through the years. I know some folks have done work with predictive policing, and that is one of the scenarios that can be very dangerous because if, if police have typically arrested more of a, of a certain um, ethnicity in the past, mm-hmm. then a model may predict to, that these are the people that need to be arrested when yeah. that may not in fact be the case. It may be that you're just automating racism and we don't want to do that. Right. Um, another, another one that really scared me was um, schools. So Microsoft actually did some work with a, a school district in Tacoma, you know, with, with good intention in their heart, uh, where they basically were trying to identify children that were most at risk for um, having issues later so that they could kind of preemptively help them and give them more support. Um, however, um, one of the things like as a mother that scares me about that is that if you tell a child that they are likely to not succeed or that they're not going to do well in school, then that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, right? absolutely. People act on what they believe. right? Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. And so if you tell children that, you know, this magical algorithm says that you're not going to do very well. And so that's why we're helping you extra. They're going to believe that they're not as smart. And that may, in fact, not be the case. So that's another area. We have to be really, really careful and think about it. And then, and even things not quite as dramatic, so dramatic as, you know, these situations. Yeah. Um, there was one example that I remember. It was a city and they actually put together, um, they wanted to enable their citizens to be able to report potholes. And so they had a really cool, I think, iPhone app and they w- would enable people, you know, on a map to be able to a report wherever potholes were found. And so, you know, they released that app and, you know, made it available and started gathering all this data. And then they found that most potholes were in upper middle class neighborhoods. It was very strange that they, in all of the lower class neighborhoods where they expected more potholes to actually be, no one was reporting those. And it turns out there's inherent bias just in their math method of communication because they had this really fancy, you know, iPhone app and a lot of people did not have iPhones. And so they had no way of reporting those things. So there's kind of bias in just the medium you used. If they had made that a website instead, yeah. that would have been a little easier to access from, from all over, then that may have been one way to make it a little easier. 
to enable everyone to a more inclusive yeah. design, right? Yeah. So that that certainly highlights the importance of having a diverse group of people working on these things, right? I mean, you talked about the example in education. As a mother, you were concerned about what the data could suggest and, and how that might influence children. And just having a diversity of perspectives in the room of people who are working right. on these things certainly would help in at least raising some of these concerns and making sure people are thinking about it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I know Microsoft has slightly better diversity numbers than many of the other tech giants, both in terms of gender and racial ethnic diversity, and presumably on other forms of diversity as well, but still below representative numbers. So just curious as to like, are there things you think the company should be doing or that other tech companies should be doing to improve representation? So I think there's actually two separate problems that are two separate issues. So there's the problem of a attracting women to the career in the first place. And then there's the problem of retaining them once they're here. And I think those are two distinct, separate issues. There's helping women realize that there's a place for them at the table and that, you know, this is something that everyone can do. And it's, you know, not just a Dilbert cartoon or a, um, this, you know, the way it's been portrayed on TV of the, you know, the geeky guy in the corner. Yeah. Um, this is a great career for people who are, you know, social females can enjoy this mm -hmm. career as well. So I think there's a lot of different things we can do. So I think kind of the first thing of just attracting more women, um, certainly there are opportunities with with STEM and with code.org and all of these great things out there encouraging children to code. I think there's been a lot of cool things there. Um, Sarah Chips, created these jewel bots where you can actually program little bracelets so that you can light, have them light up when you see your friends. And so there's a lot of really fun things there. My daughter has done Bitbox, which is uh, another thing where you can kind of code your own little apps in, in JavaScript and it kind of walks you through and teaches you the basics of coding um, to build these really cool, fun games that she's excited about. There's a lot of resources out there for kind of getting people excited about it, much like those early, you know, computer games did for me. And then I yeah. and then I think we also are trying, we're seeing more females, even if you look at like television shows in, what is it? Like, uh, I'm sorry, I don't watch too much TV, but I think I've seen my husband watching like, a, <laughs> like a, NCIS, like NCIS or one of those shows where it's like the girl who's the hacker now the girl who is doing the little the hacking or does the computer support and like figures out something cool. So if we can see kind of more of those things publicly, we see women in these roles on television shows and girls are enabled to code and everyone is enabled to code. People of color, we see kind of a diverse mm -hmm. group of people doing these things. Then I think we see this as, hey, this is a cool opportunity and this is for me. People like me do this too. So I think that's one part of it is attracting yeah. them there in the first place. And then there's a second issue, which is women and people of color do tend to leave the industry after after, after doing it. And I think that is kind of a separate issue because they were interested in it. They, maybe they did even get schooling in it and all this other stuff. And then they stop. They leave the field. And the data has shown that it isn't just because, you know, women want to have kids or stuff like that. A lot of times they're moving to other fields, like they'll move into um, you know, teaching or, or into medical fields or other things that you know, show that they still want to keep working, but that they just didn't like tech. And so I think that's a, a, not a separate issue, which is just making sure that we all work together to build a culture that is welcoming to everyone and that everyone wants to be a part of. But I, I think Microsoft, for example, has done a lot of things. I think they try to have some women in leadership roles. And so that's great because you feel like you can see yourself in these things. We also have a separate career track for management and individual contributors. So in a lot of companies, I find that, you know, you, you're very successful. Maybe you're the best coder in your group. And so you get promoted to manage the group. And that's actually horrible because you may have zero people <laughs> skills and you may have, you know, zero management skills. And now you're not doing, you took the best coder and basically you took him or her away from coding. And now they're doing more management type activities. And so at Microsoft, we actually have like a whole management career track where you can get up to like vice president, but we also have a separate technical 
career track where you can become a distinguished engineer or a technical fellow. And so the people that are really, really amazing coders but should not be managing people still have a way to progress their careers. And they're not put in a position where they're, you know, making other people miserable as managers. So I think that's actually a great thing to do as well. And then we have great benefits. I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, everybody wants, you know, a job that where they feel like they're making a difference and doing cool things. And Microsoft definitely has that. There's so many cool opportunities and opportunities to work on software that people all over the globe use. And that's amazing. So there's just a lot of great things, I think, to draw in a wide variety of people. Cool. So you've obviously been very successful in your career and you've been able to do a lot of different things at Microsoft and have ascended to leadership roles there. And so just wondering if you have any like pieces of advice or wisdom that you can share for females that may be entering the field or, you know, coming in out of college or grad school into a company like Microsoft? Yeah. So my my biggest tip for interviewing is, um, and I say this somewhat tongue in cheek, but it's uh, never stop talking. <laughs> and that's, that's what worked for me. But, but what I mean by that is kind of a, a couple things. So number one, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Like if a question isn't clear, you can ask for clarification and you can ask, you know, if it's like sort of linked list or whatever, just do you want me to optimize for space or for speed? Just to kind of show that you recognize that there's a difference there and that, you know, for different scenarios, there may be different results. And then a lot of times if you get stuck on a question too, just talking about it out loud can actually show hmm. your intelligence. So I know a lot of times the, the instinct can be you get a question, you have no idea how to answer it. And so, or you, an answer springs into your head and you know that it's wrong. So instead of just kind of, you know, freezing and kind of doing the deer in headlights thing, kind of start talking out loud about it. Say, well, the first thing that popped into my mind was this, but I know that that's wrong yeah. because blah, 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 blah. And then you, you show your thinking process. Because at the end of the day, it's not, I don't know, I as an interviewer don't actually care if you get the right answer or not. What I want to see is your thinking process. Like, can I give you hard problems to solve? And can you break those down into smaller yeah. problems? Or can you turn those into a series of next steps? You know, how do you think about these things? It's, it's kind of showing your thinking process. And so, yeah, that's, that's really important for technical interviews. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so just by showing that you understood the question or that you, you have an answer and you're understanding why it's wrong, that, that can help. And sometimes the interviewer, you know, they may have misspoke or they may have said something like, oh, you know, you can make the assumption that, you know, X, Y, Z. Interviewing is hard too. I think the other great thing about a big company like Microsoft is that you can never get bored here, right? We're doing operating systems and databases and compilers and, you know, virtual reality and gaming. And there's just so many different things that it's really hard to get bored. And so you can you can keep pursuing your passion and you can jump career tracks without losing your seniority. <laughs> um, if I ever got sick of, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence, you know, I could jump over and work on the Xbox team for a while and do gaming or I could work in um, Visual Studio and build developer tools that millions of people use across the globe. So there's there's so many neat ways to um, just keep going and keep your career fresh and exciting. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing that and for sharing your experience and all of the amazing things that you've been working on. So what is the best way for our listeners to stay connected and to learn more about your work and all of the exciting projects going on at AI for Earth? Yeah, so we have an AI for Earth website, and I can send you that link to include in your show notes if you like. And then we also have, um, I have a blog, which is blogs.msdn.microsoft.com slash Jennifer. And then I'm on Twitter as well. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's really been a pleasure speaking with you. I loved hearing about all of the amazing things that you're doing. It's super fascinating. So I can't wait to share it with our listeners. Thank you so much for your time. And yeah, just appreciate all that you're doing. Thank you. For all of you out there listening, thank you so much for joining me this week. You can find the links to everything we talked about today in my show notes at goodbyteventures.com. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please reach out to me on Twitter at TechForwardPod or on Instagram at TechForwardPodcast. Remember, you can also connect with me by signing up for my newsletter at goodbyteventures.com slash tech dash forward dash podcast. That's bite with a Y. If you enjoy the Tech Forward podcast, 
please share a link with your friends over on the social media channels where you're most active. Also, please do consider writing a review of the show on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to the show. Reviews and social shares are one of the best ways for new listeners to find us. Thank you again for listening. See you next week.